it's like we always say, like my relationship with God, is, uh, it's not private, but it is certainly personal. I don't see him as being human, so you can't have a human relationship with him. Naniniwala ako na tayo ay magka, mayroong personal na relationship sa Diyos dahil sa scripture at sa pagmamahal natin sa anak niyang si Jesus. There are people who believe that, that uh, uh, what shirt I put on this morning, that, that God cared what shirt I put on. That's nonsense. I do think God is so big and so vast that um, we'll never get to know him exhaustively. I felt like I heard a voice from heaven speak to my situation and tell me that everything was going to be okay. And I've lived a blessed life since then, since turning my life to God. You have to experience it for yourself. I think it's it's something hard to describe unless you're actually willing willing to go there. I didn't even think about what kind of shirt I was wearing until I saw that video <laughs> this morning. We have made it to the last question of our series in, uh, called Exploring God. And next week, we'll launch into a new series. In your message notes, in the back side of your, your message notes there in your bulletin, I placed a graph because I want to catch us up and just do a quick review uh, because it wouldn't help us to go back through the questions that we've already gone through within the context of the, the final message here. So I'm just going to cover briefly, briefly, the ground that we have already covered. And some of you may be like, Derek, this is my first time. I've made it three of these uh, 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 six, uh, seven messages up to this point. Um, and, and that was a question that I had, and I can't believe I missed that Sunday. And, and so this may help you kind of go back to revisit some of what we've already covered. We began with Stephen Colbert's question uh, to uh, Andre, uh, uh, sorry, Neil deGrasse Tyson who is an atheist to astrophysicist. And uh, that's the philosophical question, is it better to know or not know? The truth is we've gone through all of these concrete questions through these last weeks and we've asked them and answered them really honestly and I think uh, satisfactorily. But after all this time, you're still left with the question, do I really want to know or do I not want to know? And one of the things that we said was that ignorance is not bliss. Right? You can't claim ignorance if you're like, well, it's, if you think the cliff doesn't exist because you're ignorant, you discover once you fall off the cliff that ignorance is not bliss. So it's better to know than not to know. And so then we got into these questions. The very first question we asked and answered was, does life have a purpose? I mentioned to you that this is the question that I wrestled with the most as I was considering God and Jesus and what does it all mean? Uh, this is the question that gnawed at me like a rat and nudged me like a puppy constantly. What in life is actually worth living for, right? Is there any significance to life? Does life have a purpose? And the answer we came up with was, yes, actually it does. And we were made on purpose and with meaning. We decided that really free will is a preferable choice than determinism, where the math just decides your actions. So you're not responsible for you because, hey, the mathematical formula fell in place, and so that triggered your decision. That's why you've decided to do what you do. See, Derek, it's all mathematics. But we said, no, there's a God of the universe because we see the evidence of free will around us, and we can see the purpose and the longing for significance that we have. I mean, why even have that longing if the longing doesn't lead us somewhere? The next question we asked and answered was, is there a God? Is there a God? And the answer became, God shows himself in big and small ways to everyone everywhere. And we looked at this uh, from the perspective of the creation of the universe all the way down to cells, okay? God shows himself to everyone everywhere. The third question we asked and answered was, why does God allow pain and suffering? And I said, if the first question is the one that I wrestled with the most, the second question is actually the one that uh, helped me cross the threshold of faith. Because I grew up in a house where my mom suffered terribly. I grew up every day not knowing whether she was going to live or die. And this was probably the most joyful woman that I'd ever met. She had more joy than I did, which was frustrating because I was healthier than she was. And I remember saying, Mom, you tell me why I should follow your God. And she said, Derek, I would rather be sick and know Jesus than be healthy like you and not know him. And it was the very first time that it ever occurred to me that someone might choose sickness if it meant knowing Jesus, rather than, who cares if there's a God? I can be healthy. 
And, and for her to say that she'd make that choice caused me to think, maybe I'm missing something. Turned out, I was missing something. I was missing Jesus, and I can say that today. Uh, so we need to remember that we actually weren't created for pain and suffering. That wasn't God's original plan for us. What we did, the actions that we chose, led to pain and suffering. So the answer became, we live in a mess we initiated, made hopeful by the love of God, by, sorry, by the love that God extends. The fourth question we looked at was, is Christianity too narrow? Christianity is narrow. Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, right? It's as narrow as Jesus, but it's incredibly inclusive. So God is as inclusive as anyone, literally anyone, willing to accept his personal imitation of love. So it's not just for a few people, but God says, listen, anyone who will accept it, I will receive to get out of the mess that you initiated. But understand that it is a narrow invitation because it goes through one person. Well, that led us then to the question, is Jesus really God? And people like to interpret Jesus in all kinds of different ways. He's a good teacher. He's, uh, I love like the, uh, the hippie-esque kind of way of looking at Jesus, right? Mainly because it's like so bohemian. You want to, you know, run out and put Birkenstocks on, right? Like Jesus, man, he's just like the embodiment of the divine. You know, he's like this divine force. He's like the best human that we could have, you know, all this stuff. The problem is Jesus doesn't leave himself open to some sort of a weird mystical interpretation. Jesus himself claims to be God. And we looked at all the evidences of that, and we looked at what the audience thought of the day. We looked at what history saw him to be God. We saw how he proved himself as God. So the answer became, because Jesus is God, we're invited to find our life in him, through him, and by him. Then last week, we looked at this question of, is the Bible reliable? Now, uh, some of you, like me, thought, why didn't this question come first? Because we've been looking at a lot of Bible, Right? Uh, but if this question just happened to land on week six. And so we looked at the extra biblical evidence. We looked at the accuracy of the Bible. And I brought up two vinyl records. One was of Handel's Messiah of a symphony that was recorded in 1960 in Dublin, uh, Dublin, Ireland. And the second was of that other great, incredible orchestral band, Mr. Mister. Okay, so, because Kiri Lazon loves me. Anyway, uh, so I brought up both of those albums and I said, remember... Unless you're in the room, the room is the original recording, right? The room is the original. But what we have is an accurate representation of the original, and that's the Bible. And it turns out that the Bible is far more accurate than other ancient documents that we have by a long shot. And we looked at all of the accuracies and discrepancies and all of those things that people would say is problematic. So we did all that last week. So if you're interested in that, go back and check out that message. This morning, we're going to ask and answer the question, based on all of these answers now, can I know God personally? So to get there, we're going to start in John chapter 1. John chapter 1, and we're going to look at three verses. Verses 10 to 13. In the Bibles around you, it's page 886. So if you need to uh, get there easily, just go to 886, turn to your iPhone, turn to your Android, turn to, wh however you need to get to this passage, get to these three verses, okay? That's really what I'm trying to say. Grab those, grab your message notes, or you're going to feel a little uh, like you're wandering a little bit or just trying to sit through something. And my goal for you is not have to get through this message this morning, but it's actually since you're here to engage with it. So John chapter 1, we're going to look at verses 10 through 13. Won't you stand with me in honor of God's word? So it picks up speaking of Jesus. He was in the world, and the world was made through him. Now that's a big statement about Jesus being God. Yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. In fact, we know they crucified him, right? But to all who did receive him, and there were those who received him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, they, they wanted it really badly, nor of the will of man, but of God. Can I know God personally? Well, it seems to indicate here, God is eminently personal. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, I need you to do that which I can't. I need you to speak clearly in this room. The wind is blowing outside, but we need to hear your voice inside. Father God, I pray this morning that you would find us receptive to your message. Do I want to know or not know? Do I walk in resistant 
or do I walk in receptive? I pray that you would find us receptive. Change us. If you are the way, the truth, and the life, then, Father God, we are receptive to seeing, more than that, to seeking who you are and following you wholeheartedly. In the name of your Son, Jesus, I pray. Amen. You may be seated. Well, over and over again for the last several weeks, I've been stating what the core problem is in many different ways. And so I've been thinking about this uh, at length, and I thought well, maybe I can put it this way, because this is really the problem, regardless of the week that we're looking at, that we all face. Here's the problem. The big problem is I want to do what I want to do, and I want God to be okay with whatever I want to do, even if it kills me. That act essence, that's the problem. I want to do what I want to do, and if there is a God, I want him to be okay with anything I want to do, even if it kills me. And the challenge with that is that's not the definition of love. That's a great definition, though, for apathy. For God to say, yeah, do whatever you want to do, whenever you want to do it. If it kills you, who cares? That's not love, that's apathy. That's the antithesis of love, right? The opposite of love is an anger, it's apathy. Uh, and so I was reminded this week of a friend of mine by the name of Stefan. I met Stefan when we were living in Zurich, Switzerland a few years ago, and Stefan was a Catholic priest in the north of Switzerland in a place called Schaffhausen. He had three different parishes, and he'd been a priest for about 30 years when I met him. Now, this is Stefan's story. It's not my story. He told it to me at our first meeting. And this is not a story about Catholicism. This is a story about being close to a message and not actually hearing it. Over and over and over again. Being close to something but not getting it. So, Stefan's story to me was, he said, uh, I became so despondent because of life circumstances that after 30 years of being a priest, I decided I would commit suicide. And he said, but I had a problem, and the problem is that I'm Catholic, and good Catholics can't commit suicide. He said, so I came up with a plan, and my plan was on the coldest day of the year, I would fly north, as far north as I could, to Berlin, Germany. I would get off the plane in shorts and a flimsy t-shirt, and I would walk around for hours. I would catch pneumonia, and I would die. Then I could say it wasn't, like I didn't commit suicide, it just happened through natural causes. So, he looked at the weather forecast, sure enough, there was the coldest day of the year, Stefan got on a plane, left his three parishes, after 30 years of being a priest, landed in Berlin, and started walking around. He said about three hours in, three and a half hours in, he walked by a tea shop, and outside of this tea shop, there was this gentleman who looked at him, and he called out and said, Hey, you look like you're new here. <laughs> and he said, Well, yeah, I guess I am. And he said, Hey, why don't you come in? I'd like to uh, treat you to some hot tea on this cold day. And so Stefan is a nice person, and so he accepted his invitation. He figured, What's a 30-minute what's a session of tea, and then I'll go back outside. Well, he said, this gentleman that he sat down to talk to, right, or this gentleman that invited him was a talker. Have you, ever, have you ever been invited to something and you realized that the other person wasn't at all interested in you? They just needed a body, right? They just need like warm blood to just talk about themselves at. Like yada, 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 yada. Stefan said he got about an hour in. And he was just, you know, like it was, he said it was like death by a thousand paper cuts. And the guy was talking about how he was new in Berlin once, and he had to adjust, and, you know, he went through his whole life story. So after about an hour, they're looking at some snow starting to fall outside. And uh, Stefan was thinking to himself, okay, now is definitely a good time to get back out there. And there was an awkward pause in the conversation. And this gentleman said, listen, um, when I was new here, I, I could have used a, a friend, some help. Um, tomorrow is Sunday. And I belong to this church. Would you like to come to church with me and be my guest? Stefan said in his mind, he thought, well, this is an easy yes, because by tomorrow morning, I'll be feverish and near death. So I don't actually have to go. I can say yes, and it, I don't have to do it. So he said, sure, sure, I'll be there. What's the address? Here's the address. Here's the time. Great. Stefan spent the next eight hours wandering around Berlin in shorts 
sandals, and a flimsy t-shirt, hoping for pneumonia. He said he woke up the next morning without a sniffle. <laughs> Stefan's a nice guy, so he said he went to the church. He said, Derek, I don't know how to explain it, but I sat in the back row in plain clothes, and for the first time in my life, I saw worship. And for the first time in my life, I heard the gospel message. I don't know how to explain it. I've been doing it for 30 years, but I'm just telling you for the first time ever, I heard the gospel message. And some of you, you, you know what he's talking about. You've been in religious spaces. You've been in services. You've been in institutions. And you're like, yeah, I, I didn't hear the gospel during the times that I was there either. And so what I want us to do this morning, the way I want to close this series is I just want to go through the simple message of the gospel. And we're going to use the Bible. And the reason we're going to use the Bible is, last week we covered, is the Bible reliable? So knowing that the Bible is reliable, we're going to use the Bible because we can trust what the Bible has to say. And so I just want to walk back through the simple message of the gospel. And maybe this will be the first time that you actually hear it as well. The very first thing we have to see is that there's a holy God, a holy God. What does that mean? Well, a holy God means that God's perfect. Oh, that makes sense. God is completely true. Well, that makes sense. If there's a standard, surely God is the standard. So that standard is pure. It's not diluted in any way, shape, or form. And the challenge that we faced is we looked at that standard, and because of free will, and we covered this earlier, because of our free will, because God is holy, God said, listen, I need you to be holy like I'm holy, and yet I also want to love you, and because I love you, I'm going to give you free will. And we freely chose to reject that love, and therefore we chose to reject that holiness, and so by definition, we became unholy. And imperfection entered the world. Everything was very good. Guess who messed it up? We did. We messed it up. Uh, scripture has something to say about the holiness of God. Look at Isaiah chapter 6 and verse 3. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Okay, fair enough. God's holy. I get it. He's the standard. But now look at Isaiah 59 too. This is Old Testament, by the way. But your iniquities, your imperfections, have made a separation between you and your God. And your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. In other words, I can't do what I want to do and have you be okay with it too, especially if you're the standard for what I'm supposed to be and who I'm supposed to be. If I've rejected you and I've rejected everything that's good, then I have to live with that rejection and the consequences of that rejection. Well, the consequences of that rejection are a separation between God and us. And listen, in all fairness, God could have ended it right there, right? Have you ever been betrayed? Have you ever offered something and someone turned you down? It wasn't you turning them down. They turned you down. What did you want to do? You want to say, well, go then. Get out. Yeah, it was an offer for you. It was just a dinner. Who cares? It was just a trip. You go your way. See if I ever ask you again. God could have done that. In fact, with the angelic rebellion, God did do that. But God does something remarkable in His holiness and in His love. We'll talk about that in just a second. The other side of this is that God doesn't like to watch us torture ourselves. God, I know better than you. If you're, if you're there, guess what? I'm probably a better version than you are. And we've covered all the reasons why people think that earlier. But look at Psalm chapter 5. For you're not a God who delights in wickedness. Evil may not dwell with you. It's the idea of dwelling. Some people say, Derek, you know, can God be in the presence of evil? Well, during this grace period, clearly he can. God sent Jesus. Jesus was with us. We're not perfect. So therefore, yes, God can. God showed his back to Moses. Last time I checked, Moses not perfect. But this is a very specific period of time. God can't keep that relationship with us if we're imperfect, if we have sin, if we have iniquity in our life. God just can't do it. Why? Because that means I have to watch the person who rejects me continue to reject me and choose separation and death without me, but I'm the key to life. How do life and death coexist in that way, in a relationship kind of a way, without it just becoming circular? And we've already looked at why reincarnation doesn't work. So God says, listen, man, we're, we're separated. And there's a gap here. There's a, a divide 
The other thing to note here is that we are not holy. And I say this, and I, I, I feel like I'm pointing out the obvious, right? Because does anybody in this room really believe they're perfect? If you raised your hand, you have bigger issues than this message, okay? We all know we're not perfect. Any imperfect thought, any imperfect action. Here's the problem. A lot of us like to justify our thoughts and actions as if we are perfect. Because a lot of us secretly, deep down, think we really do know better. And so we behave as if we are perfect, and the challenge there is we know we're not, and there's a rub there. You, you're not the best arbiter for your truth. Why? Because your truth changes based on your imperfection or perfection at the time that you're alive. And sometimes that even depends on the season that you're in. How many older people realize that they were pretty arrogant when they were younger? Right? You learn things over time. So listen to these verses. This is Romans 3.23, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Well, that makes sense. He's perfect, I'm not perfect, so I fall short of that. Romans 6, 23a, the first part of this says, reminds us, for the wages of sin is death. The consequences, the price for doing what I want to do when I want to do it, leading my own life, is death. Why? It's the opposite of the life that God gives. But now the challenge is serious and it's real. All of us have a real problem on our hands, which is how do I get from here to there? Look at this verse from 1 Peter. But as he who called you is, what's the word? Holy. You also be holy in all your conduct. How in the world am I supposed to do that? There are no perfect people. How am I supposed to be holy in all my conduct? Since it's written, you shall be holy for I am holy. And so what happens is humanity from millennia have asked this question, okay, there's clearly a gap here between you and between me. How do I reach a holy God? And we call things religion when it's man's attempt to create little moral constructs that we can fulfill in order to reach this holy God. God will see that I recycle and he'll accept me. God will see that I'm an awfully nice person deep down. I said kind of a jerky thing, but God knows I didn't mean it, and I'm sorry, and that counts. And I went and I confessed, or I did this, or I did that. And by doing all these things, now I have earned my way to God. But the problem there is, again, we're fallible. The problem there is, again, we're imperfect. So whatever system we come up with, that's going to be an imperfect system because it's based on on us trying to reach God. It's centered on our abilities. And let's just be honest, our abilities are flawed. So God does something remarkable. And I know a lot of us pretend to be God, like, God, I would find a different way, but truthfully, this is about as imaginative and creative and beautiful as you can get. God finds a way across this universe that divides us. And it is a universe that absolutely divides us. So here's the second thing to know. Across the universe. First is holy God. Second, across the universe. I thought I was being clever when I came up with this because I was thinking about the Beatles. And uh, then we got into a huddle, and, and uh, I'm with some millennials in this huddle. And uh, one of them said, I wasn't even thinking Beatles. Like, I was thinking, and he mentioned this worship song called Across the Universe. And, uh, and the implication was, man, you're old. And, um, and I didn't say it, but I thought, depart from me, Satan. I, no, I'm just kidding. I'd... So God decides that he's got to bridge this universe because we can't bridge the universe to him. So I'm going to do something unusual. I want us to turn to another passage of Scripture. Typically, we turn to one. That's our central passage. We started in John chapter 1, but I really want all of us to turn to this next passage. This is just Colossians chapter 1. And it's 10 verses. It's verses 13 to 23. Colossians chapter 1, verses 13 through 23. There's some big statements in here, statements which go back to the ground we've already covered. Is there a God? Is Jesus really God? Is Christianity too narrow? All those things. But look at this with me. It's page 983. God, he 
has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. He, Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth. Now, by the way, that's a huge statement about the nature of God. Right? To say that everything was created through Jesus is a huge statement. In heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he's before all things, and in him all things hold together. Okay, I get it. Man, you're God. I got it. And he's the head of the body, the church. He's the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God, this holy God, was pleased to dwell and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of the cross. And you, who were once alienated and hostile in mind. I love the honesty of Scripture here. In other words, there are people in this room who are already hostile in mind and alienated to anything I'm saying. But you've already decided. You walked in, you sat down, you said, I, you've got nothing that I'm going to listen to. Right? And by the way, we were all there at one point. And it says, you were alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds. He's now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you, there's the word, holy and blameless and above reproach before him. If indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, became a minister. And so here's what's happening. There's a power to love. See, power of love is not like just a Huey Lewis in the news song. The power of love is a statement about the, the strength that love can have to move across the universe. Because the nature of God is not just holy, the nature of God is also love. What's the first rule of love? Love meets you where you are. That's the very first rule. If you have a girlfriend or a boyfriend and you love them, you meet them where they're at, you don't constantly expect them to meet you where you are. If you have a child, you meet the child and speak in languages that the child can understand. You don't speak in university language and alienate the child. Well, that's the first rule of love. Well, God because of his love, said, I need to give some time so that they can change their minds. And not only that, I need to provide a way that they can be holy as I am holy. So how do I do that? Well, Jesus, who is God and is one of the triune God, God the Father said, okay, Jesus, I want you to go and become incarnate, take on flesh so you can live the perfect life. No imperfect thoughts, no imperfect actions. Why? Because we can't. Why? Because we blew it. So Jesus came and lived the perfect life. Then he said, listen, by Jesus' death, when you give your life over to him, by Jesus' death, you will be holy so that we can dwell together. And I'm going to give you this period of time so that that can happen. There is a power here. Because remember, we rejected God of our own free will. God never rejected us. Let me repeat that. God never rejected us. We rejected Him. We chose the opposite of the life that He wanted for us. We weren't created for a world of pain and suffering. We were created for something much, much better. So instead of moving straight to judgment, God decided to give us this other opportunity. Now, God was personal before. He was personal when He made us. What's the text say, right? He actually breathed into us. That's pretty personal. If I walked up to you and just started breathing on you, first you'd say, take a tic-tac. Then you'd say, you're a little too close. God the Father breathed into us. Then we rejected the love that he created us with. So he was personal before, but the beauty of God is God says, no, no, love is personal if it's anything. I'm going to be personal again. And so he makes the sacrifice personally that we can't make. His love comes with the power to save. Just look at these verses. Romans chapter 5, verse 8. But God shows his, say it with me, love. One more time. For God showed his what? Love. love. 
for us. In that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Wait, you mean I don't have to pretend to be religious? No, you don't. You don't have to be clean to take a bath. That makes no sense. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. John 14, 6, Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. We looked at this when we said, is Jesus claiming to be God and is Christianity too narrow? But here what I want you to see is the personal nature of that invitation. Jesus is saying, I'll personally do this for you. Titus chapter 3, verse 5 he, Jesus, saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and the renewal of the Holy Spirit. Well, how do I get the Holy Spirit? Well, Jesus sends the Holy Spirit. Well, how do I get to Jesus? By giving my life up to Jesus. You mean it's not by the good things that I do? No, God's not grading on a curve. We already talked about that. This is pass fail. Holiness or unholiness. And the only way you get there according to Jesus now, is through Jesus. And the beauty of that is we were actually sought out by Jesus. God at no point said, okay, you want to get to me? You reject me? You get back here. You come crawling back on your hands and knees. You come where I am. Instead, God sends Jesus to walk among us. Not only that, here's what's great. God says, you're going to bear witness to me, and then you're going to go testify to the fact that I'm still alive and still working, and you're going to go share that so that even this morning, there are multiple nationalities, multiple ethnicities, multiple tongues, multiple tribes, multiple people praising God because they saw that Jesus was in fact alive and that they were sought after by the God of the universe in his son, Jesus Christ. And when God decided to come after us, he actually modeled for us what love is. Love goes. Love initiates. Love is selfless. It's not selfish. When we ask the question, is Christianity too narrow? We saw that the invitation actually went out to everyone everywhere without the precondition of doing good things. Grace was extended our way so that we had an opportunity to take a bath, so that we had an opportunity to find saving grace in Jesus. So we literally live in a grace period of time, right? We live in this time where God says, I'm going to grace this moment for you to make a decision. Now, Here's the thing. This time isn't going to last forever. It's a grace period for you to make a decision. But at some point, here's the challenge. God's going to say, you made your decision. I'm going to give you exactly what you want. Now that's the really scary part. You fight and you fight and you fight to do life the way you want to do it. What if you get exactly what you want? There are musicians who clawed and fought their way to get in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame that got there and realized that everything they thought they were looking for wasn't found in the goal they'd given their life to. There are people, actors, who have committed suicide, comedians who have committed suicide, chasing this thing to do what they want to do, when they want to do it, and when they got there, they discovered it was the wrong thing. Here's the danger. One day the grace period goes away, and God says, fine, you can go your own way. And the challenge is, at that point, there is no coming back. Now we have this opportunity to wrestle and to decide. This is a grace period of time. Look at these verses. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not of your own doing, because you can't do it. It's the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one can boast. Have you ever met somebody who uh, really did think that they were super spiritual? I mean, they were kind of arrogant about it. Is, anybody, is it just me who meets those kind of people? All right. Because I get people, and like, they can't say they're arrogant because that would be arrogant, and they know it. You know, but it's like, here's God, and I th I'm pretty sure I'm not God because I can't say I'm God, but right underneath Him, I mean, I'm pretty sure I get 99% of my decisions right. And so they so believe in their own morality, they so believe in their own good works that they're actually incredibly boastful, but they can't say they're boastful, so that way they can brag about how humble they are. I'm so humble. This is what Paul is addressing here. It's the grace. It's not about your works. Why? So that no one can boast. All of us needed to take a bath. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 9. 
who saved us and called us to a, there's the word again, holy calling, not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace, which he gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began. And that leads us to the third thing. Holy God across the universe, invited by love to life. There's so many scriptures on this, guys, that I just literally started writing references in your message notes, and then I just got tired. So I just put the other parentheses on it. But there's so much about love and life in God's word, the things that happen when you give your life to him. Let me start with a really famous passage. You see this at football games, John 3.16. Very few people ever read John, John 3.17. We're going to read them both. For God so loved the world, loved the world, that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send in his son into the world to condemn the world. Why? We're already condemned. We did it for ourselves. We chose our own consequences, but in order that the world might be saved through him. We read the first part of Romans 6. Let's read the rest of Romans 6, 23. For the wages of sin is death. I get that. Oh, wait. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. I mean, I, I actually get something out of this. Yeah, you really do. How do I get there? Well, Romans 10, 9, and 10. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, oh, wait a second, wait a second, I, let's just stop right there. I confess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord. Who talks about Lord? Nobody talks about Lord. What, what is he saying there? Now listen, I cannot go beyond the biblical text. Because here's what it's saying. It's saying, if you believe that you can control your own life and you can own your own life and you can decide that you'll do what you want to do whenever you want to do it, then that's going to lead to death and destruction. But if you decide, listen, God, I just confess before you, I can't rule my life anymore. I need you to be the master of all of my decisions, all of my actions. Here's what that's saying. Before I decide, I'm going to run it through you first. Before I think, I'm going to run it through you first. Before I start to feel resentful or hurtful or angry, I'm going to run it through you first. Everything goes through you first. You are Lord. That's what that means. And here God is absolute. I was uh, talking with uh, someone years ago that I really, really loved. And he was wrestling with this whole idea of uh, giving his life to Jesus. And he'd done all of the hard work, right? Is it better to know or not to know? And so he, he started on this journey and he worked his way through God and Jesus. And he'd answer all these kind of head questions. And he came down to one question and he said he got stuck. We were talking and I said, man, what's, what's stopping you? You've gotten a yes to everything to this point. What's stopping you from giving Jesus control of your life? And he said, here's, here's the problem. I really want to be a rock star. What, what if I give my life to Jesus and God says, no. You're not going to be what you want to be. You're going to be what I want you to be. See, some of you, you're so worried about giving your life because you're thinking, what if he sends me to Africa? Right? For some of you, it's even worse. What if he sends you to your neighbor? <laughs> you really don't like your neighbor. What if he sends you to a coworker? What if he asks you to be something you never dreamt you could be? Or maybe even really wanted to be? And there, I just, all I could say was, yeah, that's the crux of it. That's exactly the issue. Because the truth is, sometimes God does say, hey, I want you to be a rock star. But the point is that the decision is his to make, not yours to make. And some of us hold so tightly onto our lives, we just don't want God to take it over for fear of what God may actually do. But here's the truth of Scripture. The plans God has for you are so much better than the plans you have for you. And I know you think you've got great plans, and they include a giant mansion, a beautiful family. You'll never move. Your whole family will be happy every Thanksgiving. No one will ever get into a fight. I know you have those plans for you, but I'm just telling you God's plans are better and bigger. He brings you to life. And so we're invited by grace as a point of grace, and this place is called Grace Point. The grace of Jesus invites us to join him into his family of grace. He extends an invitation our way. He says, listen, I, I want you to give control to me. The text says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. 
So I've got to admit it. I've got to mean it. This is not about saying a prayer. This is not about a ritual. This is about giving my life over to Jesus. And when I do that, Jesus says, listen, here's the beauty of the good news. I will come in and make you sa and save you because only I can do that. I'll reveal to you that I'm here and real and matter. But you need to say yes. I talked about a grace period earlier, and we are in that grace period. But God does raise us to walk to life. What he has for us is much better than what we have for us. Last week, we had some baptisms here, and they were awesome, right? We celebrated, we partied. Listen to these words from uh, Romans chapter 6, verse 4. We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. Jesus offers you newness of life. We're in this grace period. God gives us this moment, but understand this grace period is going to end one day. And you don't know when. This last week I was uh, called up by my daughter-in-law. And she said, Dad, would you mind praying? Um, my uncle is in the hospital and it doesn't look good. And so uh, we started praying. And so we prayed for him for a few times now. And uh, the next text that I got, it said, amazing. He's come out of the surgery. It went really well. Everybody's gathered around him. Things look great. And he was dead less than 24 hours later. The truth is you don't know what's going to happen when you walk out of this building. You don't know what's going to happen now. I don't know. Jesus could come right now. And at that point, this grace period is over. It's over. There's not another time beyond it. And you may say, that's hopelessly unfair. Why? You fought for it. You believed that what you wanted to do was the right thing to do against all of the evidence, against everything that God has been saying and pouring in. We've talked about all of that over the last several weeks. So today is a day to make a decision. Look at these words, Revelation chapter 22, verse 20. He who testifies to these things says, surely I am coming soon. He's coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Listen to me. Today is the time to choose Jesus. Just a couple more verses, and then we'll be done. Look at this, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 2. For he says, in a favorable time I listened to you, and in a day of salvation I helped you. Behold, now is the favorable time, right? Now is the grace period. Now is the, the time where you get to decide. Behold, now is the day of salvation. This morning, now is the day of salvation. Some of you have been wrestling too long. Stop wrestling. Give up control to Jesus. John chapter 8, verse 24. I told you that you'd die in your sins. For unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. And we already saw the wages of sin is death. Remember, this is not about the seeing. If you're in the sound of my voice, trust me, you've seen. You've heard the good news of Jesus. This is about the seeking. Do you want to know or do you not want to know? Will you seek? And so I close this whole series out with this verse. Isaiah chapter 55 and verse 6. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. And he is near and in this room right now, and now is a moment for you to decide to give him control of your life. The big idea, I can know God personally by giving him control of me. Why? Because repentance means that Jesus is Lord. So that Jesus can be the bridge making me whole. Why? Because it's Jesus who saves. So with every head bowed and every eye closed, we're going to transition into the Lord's Supper together. But before that, I'm just going to give you an invitation. Holy God, who came across the universe, who's invited you by love to life. I'll say a prayer in just a moment for you. I can be the words for you, but you'd have to mean it with all your heart. If you want to give your life to Jesus this morning, would you raise your hand right where you are? This is your invitation. I see that hand. Keep it up. Nice and high. I see that hand. Nice and high. Keep it up. I see those. Nice and high. Keep them up. Come on, this is your moment of courage. I see that hand. This is your moment of courage. Hold them up high. Hold them up high. I see that. Keep them up. Keep them up, guys. Don't put them down. Keep them up. 
All right. Five of you? Four of you? Five? Okay. For the five of you, just raise your hands. You can put your hands down. I'm going to say this prayer, but listen, you have to mean it. You have to mean it. I'll be the words, but there's no formula that makes this thing happen. It has to be heartfelt. Here's the prayer. God, if you're real, I'll give you everything to know you. Jesus, take control of my life. Take over my heart. Take over my actions. Take over my attitudes. I want you to be Lord in everything. And there's nothing I can do. All I can do is just invite you in. And I can only invite you in because you're inviting me. So even as you're reaching across the universe looking for me to say yes, you need to know that right now I'm saying yes. Yes, I give you my life. Save me. You promised you would if I said yes. Fill me from the inside out and change me forever. I don't know what's next. I don't, I'm not even sure I, I care about what's next. I just know that in this moment, at this time, I need to give you everything that I am. In the name of Jesus, for the first time, really, I pray. Amen. Look up. If you said that prayer this morning, listen to me, your life is forever changed. And when you give your life to God, that you saying this is yours, Jesus says, thank you very much. Now, I want you to test my grip strength. Do you think you can take your life back? No. Your life belongs to God. It belongs to Jesus. You're just not strong enough to take it back. And understand, when you make this decision, this is a life-changing decision. And the enemy doesn't like this life-changing decision. About a week ago, we had someone come to faith in the office. And we prayed around him and said, man, the enemy's going to attack. Just be aware. Things are going to happen that you can't explain. So we're just going to pray some protection over you. He literally made it to just, just outside these doors when his former drug dealer called him to see if he wanted anything. So understand, if you've given your life to Christ, here are some words for you. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Are you with me? Do you hear me? I'm talking to you. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. For the rest of us, how often do we try to wrestle back control of our life from God or pretend like our morality is getting us anything? Remember, it's all the result of that grace that's on us. We're going to move into a time of Lord's Supper together. If you have just given your life to Christ, this is the first Lord's Supper you can participate in. And I want to encourage you to participate in because now it has meaning. If you're not a follower of Jesus, if you're still wrestling with this thing, that's okay. This is the place for you. But just be polite, because otherwise it's just going to be bread and wine. It'll be, it wants, it's not going to make sense to you. And it's going to be insulting for the, those of us who have actually given our lives to Christ. So just be nice. That's all I'm asking you to do. You've been polite so far. You haven't, like, booed me or anything. So just be nice for the next few moments, okay? Here's what uh, the text says. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me.